So Fire Emblem Engage has been out for a while now, and I think I've mastered the game's mechanics. So I wanted to test my skills. I wanted to see if I could beat Fire Emblem Engage without any of my characters gaining stats on level ups or a 0% growth run. I'm also not going to use any of the DLC. Be sure to like and subscribe if you enjoy and let's begin. So I start up the game and of course I play on Maddening Classic as I'm not a filthy casual. The prologue is entirely unchanged and Sombron is taken down with Lodestar Rush. On Chapter 1, I intentionally avoid killing the Lower Corrupted, as when I gain the Marth Ring, I can gain SP from killing them. SP makes actually gaining EXP worthwhile in this run. Additionally, I want to maximize Elias' EXP gain while I can, as at level 10 I can promote to gain a few stats. I now defeat the Corrupted and get a fantastic level up resulting in me gaining a total of 0 stats. On Chapter 2, I charge at an Axe Fighter in an attempt to break it, but I just end up missing. Lumera now congratulates me on doing nothing of value. I now begin to clear up the enemies and bait out Lumera with a Leer. With some chip from Clan, I'm able to finish off Lumera with a Leer. The second part of the map is mostly easy, but when Lumera comes at me, I play extremely haphazardly, as my units other than a Leer cannot die on this chapter. On enemy phase, I defeat the Sword Cab and weaken Lumera for a Leer to finish her off. On Chapter 3, I play a little aggressively on Turn 1, baiting out a few foes on enemy phase. On Turn 2, we gain some reinforcements with Venturon, who is fairly bad, Alfred, who is even worse, and Etia, who has decent strength and is useful for shooting down flyers in the early game. My new units make clearing up the remainder of the map fairly easy. Against the boss, I try to feed the kill to Illyr for the SP, but he's too weak and I have to make do killing them with Boucheron. On chapter 4, we gain 3 allies and they're all quite good. I now do the typical strategy of sending most of my squad to the east and using Warp Ragnarok to help out Louis and Chloe. I continue to hold the fort near the center of the map while the rest of my army catches up to Saline and her retainers. When the boss starts to move, I use Chain Guard to bait him into attacking Etia. Then on the next player phase, Saline attacks the boss, defeating him and ending the chapter. During the exploration section, I pick up a dog as they are the best animal because they give you extra iron, steel and silver ingots that are useful for forging. On chapter 5, I play aggressively and charge at my enemies. Then I take out all the enemies in my range and send Louie at a thief. On the next turn, Louis continues to be an absolute MVP by soloing half the map, while the rest of my squad struggles to stay alive. I eventually clear up the first group of enemies and open the door. Ben Churon now lives up to his name and dies, so I rewind and play it a little safer to keep him alive. The remainder of the map is fairly trivial, except for the boss who is quite strong, and one-shots most of my units. To beat the boss, I use my tankier units to block him off while simultaneously attacking him. This takes down one of his HP bars. On the next turn, my units are more than strong enough to finish him off. By defeating him, I gain a Seraph Robe, a stat booster that is noteworthy as they are one of the only ways I can increase my unit's stats. Now I take a detour to gain an s rank Cedar Bond Ring and take on Paralog 1. This map is fairly easy, but I have to make sure I play fast so I can gain the energy drop located in the village in the bottom right of the map. After clearing out most of my enemies, I use Warp Ragnarok to shield a villager from an archer. Then on the next player phase, I finish him off and use Kanta to prevent Alir from dying. Louis then ends the map with his Iron Lance. On Chapter 6, we are joined by Yunaka, who is pretty useful for the next couple of chapters. This map's gimmick is that it is a Fog of War map, but this detail is fairly trivial as I have beat the game multiple times before, and know where most of the enemies are positioned. The top half of the map is fairly annoying, as Alir has very low stats, and I have to rely on Yunaka. The bottom half of the map is easy, as we have access to Louie, who is a powerhouse, and can easily deal with most of our adversaries. I now breeze through the map and bait out the boss. I now sandwich the boss between Louis and Vanda to prevent him from moving. Suddenly, a mage shows up who one rounds Louis, so I retreat into the lower forest and use Chain Guard to bait out the boss's attack. On the next turn, I use a torch to uncover a space for Chloe to attack safely against the mage and finish them off with Louis. With all other enemies gone, the boss is easy and I finish them off with Saline. On Chapter 7, we are joined by three units who are all quite solid. I take out the enemies in my range on turn 1 and continue to move up. I end up getting overconfident and Saline almost dies to me not paying attention, but she survives, allowing me to clear up the first wave of enemies and move on to the second group. The second formation of enemies is fairly easy, but I don't have the firepower to finish them all off, so I have to leave an archer alive who cannot kill any of my units. I now place Yunaka in range of Hortensia and back her up with a chain guard to ensure her survival. On the next player phase, I rush to take out Rosado because I want his steel axe. My remaining units now all gang up on Hortensia and I land the killing blow with Vanda. With the master seal I obtained from Hortensia, I promote Citrine and head to the Ana Paralog. I give Citrine the Makaya emblem because of great sacrifices high SP gain. 
gain, as I want her to reach 1000 SP before chapter 10, so she can inherit Kanta. On turn 1, I use Warp Ragnarok to beat up an Armonite, and then use Kanta that I have recently obtained to move away. On the right side of the map, I have Louis lead the charge and he manages to take out a thief before they reach a chest. I now slowly move my other units to the center of the map and bait out the boss. I then retreat Yunaka to a nearby forest where the boss cannot hit her, so she chases after Elkris. After I've cleared out the boss's underlings, I position to take her out on player phase. I get the kill with Citrine because, again, I want her to get 1000 SP before chapter 10. For chapter 8, I promote Saline because I want another healer. Chapter 8 is a defeat boss map disguised as a defend map, and we are joined by two units that are both okay, but end up falling off around so I send Louis to take the right side of the map and use Ultcrest to shoot down the flyers. My remaining units pick off the stragglers. Things get a little close as Zelkov and Kagetsu come at me but fortunately I end up taking them down without problems. When Ivy starts to move, I use Yunaka to bait her away from the rest of my army as they finish off the remaining enemies, including a mage that has a droppable secret book. I now move Yunaka back to the rest of my army and use Obstruct to prevent Ivy from using the killer axe. Now I surround Ivy and slowly chip her down. I get the kill with Yunaka and end the map. We now gain access to the leaf ring that is unfortunately barely mediocre, but it also gives me access to the Olwyn bond ring. This ring is very good and I reset until I pick up three of them. On chapter 9 we are joined by Jade who is under attack, so I send a squad to the north and south to take out the enemies in an attempt to rescue her. I just barely get there on time and send Diamond to take on Kagetsu. Kagetsu dies to a quadruple hit and Selkov's squad of thieves don't move because I didn't provoke them. This makes it easy to clear up the remaining enemies and I move my squad near Ivy. I now send all my units at Ivy resulting in an easy victory, but I have to make sure to weaken some of my units so that when Citrine uses great sacrifice she gains enough sp that she can learn canter for the next chapter alchris now shoots down ivy ending the chapter just before attempting chapter 10 i reset for an s rank deirdre ring it has the renewal skill that regenerates 5 hp every turn i use this with a chia depth to be able to use chain guard on every turn i also have inherited canter to a few of my units forged a couple of weapons and promoted diamond as for the chapter, I use the combination of my Die Thunder users and Kanta to hit and run with Saline and Citrine. On enemy phase, some foes approach me. Fortunately, my units on the left side are able to wipe out my foes. On the right side, however, I place Yunaka on a pillar so she can't be hit and take out an archer with quadruple hit. With the initial enemies dealt with, I move Citrine up to take out the thief and prepare to take on Hortensia's group. To bait out the enemies, I place Yunaka on a pillar. She unfortunately gets frozen, but this doesn't matter as she can't be hit. I now annihilate the enemies on the right side and bait out Hortensia with Diamond. Hortensia now dies to a crit and I approach Morian. He gets blown up by Citrine and I move up to defeat Hyacinth's clones. On the next turn, I finish off Hyacinth with Diamond and end the chapter. On chapter 11, we are defeated in a cutscene, but we can't fall here, and I begin to make my retreat by defeating a Corrupted with the Roy Ring. I don't group my units to prevent the Corrupted with Makaya's Ring from freezing multiple of my units in one turn. I now make my way south, taking down enemies on my way, an easy task thanks to Citrine. Eventually, I get three reinforcements with Ivy, who is good, Zelkov, who is good, and Kagetsu, who has the wrong stats. So I make some modifications and replay the map. Kagetsu now has the correct stats, and I easily rush to the escape point to beat the map with ease. On chapter 12, we begin the soul maps, and they're all fairly easy as we gain a large amount of strong pre-promotes that make the maps fairly easy. On this map, we gain Fogato, who is okay, Pandero, who is pretty good, and Bune, who has stats comparable to a level 6 Louis if he promoted to a Great Knight. For this chapter, I move towards the enemy and obliterate most of them. Reinforcements eventually show up, but they are no problem, and I beat the map before another wave of reinforcements shows up. On chapter 13, I forget to record the first few turns, but that doesn't really matter because we are in Solm home to the most boring maps known to man. I take down the flyers with my upper group of allies while my lower group heads to the southern village. Eventually, I clear up the lower part of the map and collect the rescue stuff. I now bait out the bosses, so one goes up and one moves left. This puts them in position for me to finish off one, and on the next turn, I beat the second boss, and beat the map. For chapter 14, we gain access to the Ike Ring, so I can gain an axe proficiency. This allows me to reclass Kagetsu to a hero, for access to reliable 1-2 to two range with a hand axe. Additionally, the hero class gains access to the brave assist skill that will be very useful later on when combined with dual assist plus. Anyway, the chapter is very easy, the thieves are beat on turn 3 and then I can take the map very slow and I don't have any problems until I reach the final room. I now bait out Zephyr and destroy her on player phase, then Movia and Marnie move 
On the next turn, I beat them both, with Movia dying to Bune and Marnie getting blown up by Citri. Then I finish off the remaining enemies around Hortensia. Hortensia was fairly easy as she only has Luan, so she can only attack at one range. This makes defeating her very easy. On chapter 15, we gain Hortensia, who is really good, and Seedol, who is really, really good. This map is mostly easy, but I overestimate Seedol's durability and he almost dies. After rescuing him, I clear up the Miasma with the Koran Ring and bait out the enemies. I then obliterate the enemies on player face and do the same for the next room. I purposefully avoid opening the door to delay the reinforcements, then storm into the next room and prepare to take down our enemies on the next turn. This plan is successful and I move to the final room. With Citrine, I attack the boss and canter to retreat. This baits out the enemies and now I kill most of my foes in the room and the ones that I don't kill, I restrict with Corin's engage skill. Then I open the chest and escape the map. On chapter 16, we are joined by Goldmary, who is solid, and Rosado, who is okay. I use Rosado to clear out the corrupted worms on turn 1 and position the rest of my squad to enter the center of the map. I now attempt to move to the center of the map, but my units aren't strong enough to fight off the enemies in the way, so I use the Flame Dragon Vein to restrict their movements and prepare for the next turn. I crush the enemies and now rush to take down the bandit to prevent them from destroying the village. Some reinforcements show up, but with the Flame Dragon Vein, I can restrict their movements, making them them a non-issue. I now continue to hold the center of the map until all the enemies are gone and then I move in range of Marnie. This baits out Movia, then I'm easily able to kill Marnie with Kagetsu and Movia with a crit from Panette. I now inherit dual assist to most of my units and reclass some of them to hero. Then I journey to Lucina's Paralogue, a map that is quite trivial as I'm doing it much later than intended. I clear up all the enemies and then dance Kagetsu with the Corn Ring to attack Lucina. On the next player phase, I overwhelm Lucina and complete the Paralogue. On chapter 17, Pyrene is on fire and we must defeat all six enemy commanders. This map can seem quite hard, but if you know how the AI works, you can slowly pick off the enemies as they come. On turn 1, I position to bait out Briss, and then I defeat him on player phase. With the Corn Ring, I can easily control the enemies and set up for a strong player phase. Now that the first wave was taken care of, I move to bait out Marnie and Movia. I use the Flame Dragon Vein to split apart my enemies and arrange my units to take down Movia on a subsequent turn. This plan works and I dispose of both Marnie and Movia without issue. Next, I push off and use the Flame Dragon Vein to protect my units from the enemy cavalry. With this protection, I can safely move my units to crush the corrupted worms. Zephyr now moves, and because of momentum, the battle forecast lies, and I have to use the Time Crystal a few times. I eventually position correctly and survive Zephyr's override, then I beat her on the following turn. Veil and Hyacinth are pretty easy. I just use the Corn Ring to restrict their movements, then I chick them down with my units with free range to avoid counterattacks, and eventually end the map with a chain attack from Goldmary. On chapter 18, we push to the left to collect a speed ring from a thief, but this chapter features a large amount of enemies that all rush you fairly quickly, and I almost get overwhelmed. With good use of the emblem rings, I'm able to hold off my enemies, but then I have some problems when the reinforcements start to show up. With the core and engage skill, I'm able to defeat the reinforcements before they move, and my upper group of allies split up my foes coming from the right. This allows me to recruit Linden, who is very useful, and defeat the threatening enemies. With that complete, I just have to station my units in range of the boss and pelt them from free range until I defeat them. On the Ike Paralog, I rush to the left and slowly climb up the left side of the map. Enemies from behind cause me some problems, so I use Astro Storm to bait out Ike in an attempt to end the map quickly. I then position my units to finish off Ike on player phase. I have to be careful about which units attack him, as he has the Wrath skill to increase his crit chance, when on low HP. With the power of friendship, we defeat Ike and beat the map. On chapter 19, we gain Saphir, who has very good stats compared to the rest of my army. Unfortunately, she will die on turn 1 if we are not fast enough to save her, so I use Warp to recruit her on turn 1. With reposition, I move Alir back and choke the point with Saphir and Panette. Because Kagetsu gets one-rounded by a corrupted hero, I use the cannons to break fire so they cannot attack him. I continue to stay in the center of the map, and wait for Movia to expend the uses of his warp. Conveniently, around the time he runs out of uses, enemies rush me from the south, so I use the Flame Dragon Vein to restrict their movement and finish them off on player phase. I now wait in the bottom part of the map for Movia to move, while I finish off the enemies as they come. When Movia moves, I use the Flame Dragon Vein to restrict his movements. The AI for this map prioritizes staying near Movia, so restricting his movements makes all other enemies trivial. This allows me to take my time and collect the Draco Shield from the village and split up Marnie and Movia. 
With them split up, I bait out Marnie. The fire from Roy's engage attack unfortunately means I have to delay killing her for one turn. Finally, I use my free range units to lower her HP low enough that Kagetsu can finish her off. Movia now moves in, but he is easily beat with the help of Draconic Hex to lower his stats. I land the Killing Blow with Rosado to end the map. On Chapter 20, I attempt to warp skip the map, but when Gris loses one health bar, he teleports to the top part of the map, ruining my easy win. This map is noteworthy because it's a Fog of War map, and most of my foes at this point one-shot most of my units, so I have to play extremely carefully. I make sure to be extra careful and push to the right side. When I uncover a thief or a secret book, I push to clear the room of enemies. Now only Gris's group remains, so I bait out Gris with Penets, but forget about Echo and she dies. I now use my final use of the Dragon Time Crystal and bait out a Halberdier to be safe. This provokes Gris, causing him to move. To beat him, I use Roy's holdout skill to safely attack him with Panette. Fortunately, she lands a critical hit. I then weaken him at free range and finish him off with Kagetsu. Before taking on Chapter 21, we have a filler arc where we proceed to do a bunch of paralogues starting with Erika's. To start the map, I push to the left side and defeat the thief. On the next turn, I clear out most of the enemies and begin to push south. I carefully funnel enemies into the top right of the map and use it as a choke point to hold off my enemies. With the Flame Dragon Vein, I slow the southern enemies' movements, making them easier to deal with. But when the Wyvern reinforcements show up, I have to retreat a little. I continue to hold off the lower enemies with the Flame Dragon Vein and finish off the flyers on player phase and choke the point to block the heroes to the left. With the hard part of the map done, I collect the chest and bait out the final formation of enemies. Because of the Flame Dragon Vein, I have a clear path to run up to Erika and attack her. Erika was trivial to defeat, and I end her with a swing of Sophia's killer axe. On the Limb Paralogue, I opt to not deploy a full team of units and split into two groups. The bottom group takes care of the Wyverns and some of the Bonites, while my upper group takes the upper part of the map and then moves towards the center of the map. Eventually, Lin starts to move. Since the reinforcements for this map are tied to Lin attacking any of your units, I decide to locate my units to finish off Lin quickly. After baiting her out, I devastate her on player phase, winning the map. The Sigurd Paralogue is extremely easy, as there is no incentive to move forward, and I can take it as slow as I want. I decide to fight the powerful enemies in the bottom left of the map, but they aren't that hard and I defeat them without issue. After dropping the drawbridge, Sigurd charges at me, so I position my units in a way that I will trap him when he does override. With the combination of my 12 guaranteed chain attacks, even my weakest units can take down Sigurd. I try to defeat Sigurd with fire magic so I can make a joke, but my teammates are simply too strong and he dies to a chain attack. On the Micaiah Paralogue, I forget to record the first two turns, but that doesn't matter because nothing interesting happens on them. I warp in Citrine and hit Micaiah with Torrential Roar to lower her avoid, so I have a massive 48% chance to entrap her with Hortensia. This lands and I proceed to gang up on her with all of my units. Tamara lands the killing blow with a chain attack, ending the Paralogue. On Chapter 21, we are joined by Movia, who is really strong, and I will give him almost all of my stat boosters that I have been hoarding throughout the game. To start the chapter, I push to the left to take out a worm, and then I prepare for a strong player phase on the next turn. I'm able to take out most of the enemies, and the ones that I can't take out I restrict with Corrin's engage skill. I continue to hold out in the center of the map, but when a large amount of reinforcements show up, I decide I have to push to the left to win. This is problematic as all my damage comes from chain attacks, and the enemies on the left are just out of range of a majority of my units. I attempt to remedy this by moving my units in the back first. This strategy fails a few times, but I get lucky enough to take out all the enemies except for an archer that I freeze. With the help of Obstruct, Goldmary survives the Foron Mage. With this done, I have an uneventful turn, but some more reinforcement shows up, and I have to push east to safety. With the waves of reinforcements over, I slowly clear up the enemies. Suddenly, Gris starts to charge at me. Fortunately, he and his group are extremely easy, and then I position my units to bait out Zephyr. Zephyr's squad were pretty weak, and I continue to move towards Vale. I get a lucky entrap miss while reinforcements approach from the south. At this point, I realize I need to set up for a boss kill on the next turn, or I will be overrun by the Corrupted. I take out some Wyverns to keep some of my units out of their range, and then take out the Entrap user to bait out Vale. I believe Vale's group will never move off the protection tile, making this enemy phase fairly safe. To beat Vale, I employ the use of the Corrin Emblem Ring to weaken her. Then with the combined power of all my chain attacks, I defeat her and end the map. 
On chapter 22, I feed most of my stat boosters to Movia. I also use tonics to boost the stats of my other units to help them survive. To start the map, I send Linden at the Warriors and my other units right to set up for the next turn where I crush the enemy Cavaliers. On the next turn, some flyers begin to move, so I send Movia to take on the Griffins. I employ the use of Obstruct to prevent the Wyverns from attacking Movia. As a result of this, they go for Saphir. I then clear them out and some reinforcements show up. And I choke a point with Movia, then take out my foes on player phase. I now push to the center of the map. This causes some reinforcements to spawn. I shoot them down with bows and begin clearing up the center of the map. I face a slight issue with the Meteor Mage because he one-shots most of my team, but with the right positioning, I defeat him without issue. With the middle of the map mostly dealt with, I can safely push towards the bottom of the map and collect the Emblem Rings. The bottom of the map is mostly trivial, and I collect the final Emblem Ring to beat the chapter. On Selica's Paralogue, I move Movia in range of Silica to bait her out. Then with Rescue, I move my units in range to finish her off on turn 2. Chapter 23 is usually really annoying, because you are spammed by enemies with freeze to restrict your movement. To prevent this, I inherit Headlong Rush to most of my units to make them immune to freeze. On this map, I surprisingly find that Veil with the Selica Ring is extremely helpful, as if you combine Echo with a squad mostly comprised of units with dual assist, you can take out multiple units with full HP in one move. After crushing the enemies located near the start of the map, I push upward. With my units arranged into a big ball of death, I face little issue until I move near the boss. Because I didn't fight the Wyverns near the center of the map, they rush me when I fight the boss, and a few of my units die on enemy phase. I then use my final rewind and clear up some of the enemies around the boss to make my next attempt a little safer. Because I can't attack Gris this turn, I use Obstruct to protect my units while Mavia baits out a few enemies. In this position, I realize that I must rush the boss or I will lose, so I begin to attack Gris and finish him off with Rosada. With Byleth's Goddess Dance, I'm able to send my strongest units at Zephyr, and I finish her off with Veil. Chapter 24 would be a hard map, but it has the convenient win condition of it being a defeat boss chapter. This means I can walk my units at the boss to win with little effort. The boss is actually quite dodgy, so I use Torrential War to lower both his stats and his avoid. This makes Veil deal enough damage that she can finish him off with a few dancers, resulting in victory on turn 3. On chapter 25, I position my units to set up for a boss kill on turn 2. This strategy is successful and I walk my units to the boss and perform a similar strategy as last chapter, of debuffing with Corin and dealing most of the damage with Veil. I finish the easy chapter on turn 2. On the final chapter, I reclass Movia to a Swordmaster to wield a Forge Georgios to help fight Sombron's second phase. The first phase of Sombron is fairly easy, and I use Warp to kill him on turn 1. On the second phase, I destroy the Dark Emblems near the start of the map, and move most of my squad clockwise around the map. Movia tries to head counterclockwise, but now he faces some Lance units and has to retreat. Hortensia uses Rescue to transport Movia to my other units, and then I take out the third of the four Dark Emblems. Some reinforcements show up, and I decide I need to get in range of the Dark Emblem as fast as possible, or I will be overrun by the infinite waves of reinforcements. I refill Citrine's Emblem Gauge with one of the Emblem Tiles, because I will need Draconic Hex if I want to take down Sombra, and Citrine will need Corrin's Engage Attack to not die. Another wave of reinforcements comes in, and I decide this is the turn where I have to end it. I use Astrosorm to lower the final Dark Emblem's HP low enough for Aaliyah to finish it off and boost Movia's stats. With his barrier down, I use Citrine to debuff Sombron and begin attacking with my other units. Movia deals a massive 59 damage with Georgios, and he takes down two of Sombron's health bars. I now use Goddess Dance, and then attack again, landing a critical hit, putting Sombron on his final HP bar. Veil vale attacks Sombron, lowering his HP just low enough for Movia to get the kill. He attacks Sombron, landing a critical hit to end the run. To conclude the run, I personally found this very fun to do, as it allowed me to gain a new appreciation for some of the units that I overlooked on my previous playthroughs. The difficulty increase felt nice, but overall I don't think this game is that hard. Dual Assist is simply just extremely powerful and completely breaks the game. If you enjoyed this run, be sure to like and subscribe, and thanks for watching.